When engineers copy amazing technology from the living world, are they plagiarizing the creator? This week on Creation Magazine Live, engineers and inventors copying designs from the living world. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. I'm Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. What does the head of a bird have to do with bullet train design? <laughs> well, designers copied the shape of a bird's head to reduce some of the problems with their own designs. That's right. This week we're talking about uh, examples of biomimetics. As the name suggests, biomimetics involves mimicking or copying designs that we see in nature, designs right. that you see in the biological world. And there are many examples of this. Uh, for example, the geometric eyes of lobsters have inspired X-ray telescope design. And um, uh, the amazing properties of spider silk, like spider webs, essentially, have, uh, chemists have looked at that and developed things like Kevlar, very strong materials. And that's what we're talking about when we're looking at uh, uh, biomimetics, copying designs found in nature. That's right. So let's look at some of these examples. Japan's bullet trains uh, travel up to 320 kilometers an hour. That's 200 miles an hour. It's pretty amazing. However, trains that are, are coming out of tunnels at those speeds make a very loud noise, uh, like a thunderclap. Uh, caused by the change in air pressure when exiting, of course, and this is kind of a noise local residents that live nearby. Right. So bullet train chief engineer uh, Aiji Nakatsu himself asked, is there something in nature that travels quickly and smoothly between two very different mediums? And uh, avid bird watcher uh, Nakatsu thought of the design of the kingfisher that dives into the water for fish with very little splash. Copying the shape of the bird's head to remodel the front of the bullet train uh, resulted in a quieter train and uh, it actually uses 15% less electricity uh, while traveling 10% faster than before. Oh, that's, uh, that, that's amazing. So yeah. it, it travels faster, uses less electricity, and that annoying... Thunderclap sound. Bang, the, the, the thunder-like sound is, is reduced by yeah. looking at things in the living world. That's, right. uh, Nakatsu recognized that uh, the design in, in nature, and this is often, it, it's, well, nature has done this and so on, right. but he recognized that that design was worth copying. And the thing is, that design didn't come about by itself. <laughs> Here's an engineer who recognized design in nature. Design in nature requires a designer in the same way that <laughs> man-made design requires exactly. a designer. And the Bible tells us who the designer is, of course. There's no secret about that. Right. Uh, Jesus is the creator. Uh, in Colossians 1, 15 to 18, we read, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Yeah, so for, for us, for Bible-believing Christians, um, copying designs that God put in nature, put in living things, makes sense. Right. It makes sense even from a scientific perspective. In Romans, uh, in uh, rather Genesis, Genesis 1.28, we read about the dominion mandate where uh, Adam and Eve are told to subdue the earth. And, and there's some other terminology there. Scientists have long recognized that as the basis for doing some science, right. actually. The basis for science. We, we want to look at what God, what God has done and in a sense mimic that to make life better. That's one of the goals of science. Right. Um, uh, the, er the early scientists, the early scientists like Newton and Kepler and so on, uh, science was seen as a means of fulfilling God's command to subdue the earth, Genesis 1.28. Kepler and other early scientists, uh, I think Kepler was the one who coined the term, were thinking God's thoughts after him. Right. I and mean, I right. like that. Yeah. We're thinking God's thoughts after him. Here God has created this amazing capability in this animal or this thing we see in God's creation. Right and we're thinking God's thoughts after him. Well, how, do, how does this work, and, and, and how can we use it to develop technology that would, that would better life on Earth? Right, he's gone before us, and we're just copying what's already been uh, 
been done. Yes. Now, classically, science's main goal has been building knowledge and understanding, uh, regardless of its uh, potential applications. It's just people learning about the natural world, that right. we, what we call the natural world. However, increasingly, uh, scientific research is undertaken with the explicit goal of, of solving a problem or developing a technology, right? We live in a sin cursed world and we're going to try to overcome some of the problems. Right. Things like developing antibiotics to heal diseases and get rid of bacteria, trains that, that make less noise, like we were just talking about. Right. Uh, more efficient use of the Earth's resources and things like that. Those are all examples of, of biomimetics, of using what we see there to build a better world for ourselves. And that's uh, the biblical mandate from Genesis. In recent years, NASA probes have sent back images of our nearest planet, Mars. These images have prompted some scientists to suggest that a global flood once carved the Marshall landscape, even though no liquid water has yet been found. The Bible records an event that certainly sounds like a global flood on Earth. Genesis records that all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. Jesus himself, referring to those not on Noah's Ark, said, The flood came and took them all away. Unlike the elusive water on Mars, water covers 70% of the Earth's surface. And water-deposited sedimentary rock covers much of the land surface. So isn't it strange that many people who are open to the possibility of a global flood on Mars, despite the absence of water, immediately dismiss any suggestion that a global flood occurred on Earth? To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Well, if you just tuned in today, we're talking about uh, examples of biomimetics, yes. which is copying designs from, from the, uh, the biological world. And if you want to know more uh, about this, you can go to a, our, our website and check out an article, um, creation.com slash biomimetics, and it'll get into even more deeply to what we're, we're talking about here. Now, the mantis shrimp. It's got incredible eyes, uh, uh, some of those incredible eyes in the animal world. Uh, the shrimp's eyes have a technology that's similar to what is found in uh, CDs, DVDs, Blu-ray players, but, but actually way, way better than those, uh, that technology. Right. Uh, each eye can move independently and can focus on an, uh, an object with three different areas, giving the mantis shrimp trinocular vision. I mean, we've got <laughs> binocular vision, you two eyes and, and that kind of thing. Now, we, we perceive depth best with two eyes. If you cover up one eye, it's a little hard to perceive depth. But right. the mantis shrimp can do that with just one of its eyes because <laughs> it has three different parts on each eye that can triangulate position and stuff. But there's, it, it gets even better than that. Uh, they, can, they can see more of the spectrum than our eyes from infrared to ultraviolet. They can tune individual light sensitive cells depending on light levels. If it's dark or if it's light, they can tune the different cells. Now what makes them unique is their ability to distinguish between light that's polarized in different directions, including circularly polarized light. And as, as far as researchers know, they have the only cells in the animal kingdom that can detect polarized light and different types of polarized light. And that's the kind of technology that's found, as you just said, in CD players, DVD players, and Blu-ray players. Uh, it, the thing is, it's far beyond our current technology. What we can do. Researcher Nicholas Roberts from the University of Bristol said, the cool thing is, I think it's actually something you could make and it would improve the workings of current technologies such as Blu-ray which uses multiple wavelengths of light and of future data storage devices. And for more, you can uh, see about this <coughs> um, DVD makers copy mantis shrimp eye design in the article creation.com slash mantis dash shrimp dash eye. And that'll get into some more detail. So there, there's just one amazing example of here's this, this shrimp that lives, <laughs> you know, lives in the ocean and has these amazing eyes. And people kind of scratch their heads and think, well, why do they need eyes that good and stuff? Right. It just kind of, I don't know, it just kind of reminds me of the creativity of the creator. Right. He gave these amazing eyes to a shrimp, you know, <laughs> just incredible. But there's, there's so much else in, involved in biomimetics. If you go to Google, just go to Google, just search on the World Wide Web, biomimetics. And there's websites, you know, biomimetics dot different, different websites. Right. I forget them right now, but uh, just incredible examples. Spider silk. Let's, let's talk about that. In 2001, one of our scientists wrote an article on the amazing properties of spider silk, so spider webs. And, and he was comparing it to what chemists were using to make Kevlar for bulletproof vests. Now, in 2013, a Japanese company called Spiber, Spiber announced that it was beginning to mass produce 
uh, synthetically made spider silk right. with genetically engineered bacteria. So they're making <laughs> spider silk. They're making this stuff. That's right. Now, the material they're making is actually tougher than Kevlar, uh, strong as steel, uh, lighter than carbon fiber, and it can be stretched 40% beyond what its uh, original uh, length is without breaking. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, what's the big deal about spider silk, really? But artificial silk could be... Uh, could be used to create artificial blood vessels and ligaments as well as dissolvable sutures. Now, for centuries, silk was used to dress wounds um, uh, because of its antibacterial properties. Right. Um, in the auto industry, it could lead to bumpers that can absorb a very large amount of energy on impact, Im improving driver safety, all sorts of uses for this, uh, yeah, this yeah, product. Yeah, the potentials are, are huge. Uh, spider silk owes its amazing properties to a protein called fibroin. Uh, the proteins are catalysts for most chemical reactions in the cell. They help uh, bind cells together to make the various tissues. But the complex sequence of, of amino acids making up fibroin, it, it, they're having, uh, engineers are having a tough, or chemists are having a tough time recreating this in a lab. In a spider farm, we have a gazillion spiders trying to, it just, it just wouldn't work to produce uh, enough. enough for industrial use. This Japanese company is using genetically engineered bacteria to produce fibroin, which is then turned into a fine powder and spun. The bacteria, produce, the bacteria are fed sugar and salt right. uh, and, and some other micronutrients, and they can reproduce in just 20 minutes. Right. A single gram of the protein produces about 5.6 miles, 9 kilometers of artificial silk. And uh, this year, in 20, uh, 2015, they plan on uh, being able to produce 10 metric tons of silk <laughs> per year. Incredible. The vigorous promotion of evolution as established fact is causing many Christians to question the biblical creation account. And some non-Christians won't consider Christianity because they believe the Bible has been disproved by science. That's where Creation Magazine comes in. Creation Magazine is a family-friendly publication packed with cutting-edge science that supports the Bible, presented in an easy-to-understand format by some of the leading experts in their fields of study. Visit creation.com to subscribe today. This week, this week we're talking about biomimetics, and this is engineers copying designs in nature. And we're, we're, there are some amazing advances made in man-made technology, our technology, by looking at things in the, in the modern world. We talked about spider silk. If you want more information on that, go to creation.com slash spider silk. Amazing things. Uh, there was spider silk happening, apparently. So, and other bugs, you know. too, like termites. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're, they're often associated with destroying homes, not, uh, not right. helping to yeah. design them. But the Eastgate office uh, building here in Harare, uh, Zimbabwe, has an air conditioning system modeled after the self-cooling mounds of termites. Termites keep the temperature inside the nest uh, to within one degree a day and night while the temperatures outside swing from uh, 42 degrees Celsius to 3 degrees Celsius. So huge, huge uh, difference there, but they... They manage to keep their homes within one degree. That's incredible. Of what they yeah. want, yeah. yeah. They, the insects do this by constantly opening and closing vents throughout the mound to manage convection currents of air cool, um, uh, of air cooler. Uh, now, the cooler air is drawn in from uh, open lower sections while hot air escapes through the chimneys. Now, the operation of buildings, it, it uh, apparently represents 40% of all the energy used by humanity. Wow. So this, this, you know, understanding how, can we build buildings like the like the one in Africa there, uh, based on that? Well, the the, the building in Africa there it uses ninety percent less energy for ventilation than conventional buildings its size, and it's already saved the building owners three and a half million dollars in air conditioning costs. <laughs> Amazing! It's just, it's just incredible. Now, for more information, you go to creation.com/termite mounds right. and uh, and get a bit more information there. There's another great example of look at what's happening with these termite mounds here. These you know yeah. piles of mud essentially, but they're doing incredible things. How can we use that that design right. to uh, make life better for ourselves? Yeah. Fireflies. Uh, fireflies. Yeah, researchers yeah. have studied fireflies and applied the design discovered uh, there to LED lights. Okay. Um, All right. and, and normally when light passes through a boundary between different materials, of course, you lose uh, some of the light. It's lost through reflection, right? And this can be minimized through a process called optical impeding, uh, impedance matching. Right. Okay. So it turns out that the cuticles on fireflies, that's the, that's the bit that the light needs to shine through. They have a very fine structure that does exactly that. It's not totally smooth. There's a little, there's a little bumpiness there on a very, very small scale. There's tiny ridges 
150 nanometers in width, 110 nanometers in height, and the period, the distance between the ridges is uh, 250 nanometers. Now a nanometer, uh, one inch, is 25.4 million nanometers, just to get an idea for, uh, uh, for, size, for here. size here. Yeah, But it turns out that that pattern in the cuticle is that those are the best dimensions to transmit the most light at the light that the firefly puts out. It's, right. a, it's an incredible design, again, and that has been applied to making more efficient LED lenses right. in, in front of the LED lights. Yeah. Let, let's more light out. Yeah. Now, for a bit more information, go to creation.com slash firefly, and you can get some more details on that uh, amazing research there. Right. And of course, that's on our website, creation.com, but uh, a report on this amazing biotechnology um, uh, you can find elsewhere, of course, uh, made the usual fact-free homage to evolution, yes, uh, yeah. claiming efficient versions of these nanostructures has been, have been selected over hundreds of millions of years. They, the way they explain it, it's always evolution. I mean, let's think about this. What, what, you know, when I was being taught evolution in school, I was taught that you know, creatures, if, if whatever you develop provides a survival advantage to you, that's going to get retained and, and et cetera. Okay. I mean, yep. if you're a bug and you start glowing and announce to everybody, here I am, here I am, here I am. I mean, what, what's the survival advantage here? We think they're beautiful. We think they're kind of <laughs> cool. You know, my kids love fireflies and stuff. We used to go out and watch them. But what advantage is, an evolutionary advantage is that too? There's always that spin put on just about everything in the right. news, right? You, you have that in textbooks and in the media and movies and, and it's everywhere, the evolutionary spin that's placed on the data. Right. Um, but the practical research used design principles that for these LEDs, it used design principles to duplicate those nanostructures. Right. It was engineers, there were smart guys working on how to duplicate these things that ne they needed intelligence, they, they applied design. Yeah, we could ask. It's like in wartime, you know, when the enemy develops like a code machine, and and, it, and so you you try to figure out how to do that because they've designed it, and now you've got to figure out and copy their design so you can understand how it's done. We know that comes from intelligence. To, so sure. To, yeah. So to continually put this evolutionary spin on it actually doesn't make sense from from what the facts do. No, it doesn't make sense. Someone might ask, how can you believe in God when there isn't a single shred of evidence? How can you take that leap of faith? But on the contrary, the Bible tells us that the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. And since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. And perhaps sternly, the Bible tells us that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So the Bible tells us that the evidence for God is everywhere, and it's overwhelming, if we just open our eyes to see it. There are many highly qualified scientists today who believe that the Bible's account of creation is true, and that the observable scientific evidence testifies to its accuracy. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Our subject today is biomimetics, uh, developing technology based on God's design. That's right. Yeah, probably the most famous example of biomimetics is Velcro brand fasteners, <laughs> right? That's, uh, most, most viewers have probably heard of that. It was invented in 1941 by a, uh, a Swiss engineer, George de Mestrel, who took the idea from burrs that stuck to his dog's fur when they went walking through the, through the forest. And under a microscope, he noted the, the little hooks and, and barbs and so on. And that's what he based that on. That's right. A anything basically with a, with a loop, right, could, could get caught on it. Clothing, hair, animal fur. Um, and, and so that's why he, he developed Velcro based on that observation. Yeah, famous example of biomimetics. Probably the coolest application is, uh, is Velcro jumping, championship <laughs> Velcro jumping on David Letterman in, in 1984. <laughs> he had that on a show there. He had a, a whole suit of Velcro. I don't know if you've ever seen that. And he had a little trampoline, runs along, jumps on the trampoline up against yeah, the wall stick and the sticks wall. there. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, no, just kidding, obviously. There's many other <laughs> cool applications for Velcro. But. Yeah. Self-healing plastics, we have another example of biomimetics. Self-healing plastics, self-healing materials. Researchers at the Engineering and Science, Sciences Research Council are developing composite materials that bleed resin when stressed or when broken. This is phenomenal stuff. Um, effectively creating a scab that heals that area, essentially. It's an innovation that could drastically improve air safety, 
and, and, and things like that, foster development of lighter aircraft, and uh, we're essentially they're bringing biomimicry to aviation. Right, and, and the way it works is the material is made of hollow fibers uh, filled with epoxy resin, and when the fibers are broken, the, the, then the resin leaks out, um, and, and the seals, uh, it seals the break. Right, and it, it's supposedly eighty to ninety percent uh, of the original strength. Uh, this, right. this 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 patch, and of course the the epoxy is also colored, so that uh, you know it, it, mechanics can easily spot it, and they can say, oh look, there must have been a problem here, and because they they see it's 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 gone to right. work. And that works much in the same way that when we cut ourselves, there's uh, uh, there, there's uh, sticky little cells called platelets that clump together right. to to seal off the blood, and that promotes the, then the healing can begin there. And that's the principle behind these self-healing plastics. It's pretty amazing stuff. Exactly. Um, uh, Here's a, a quote. This project represents the first step, says uh, Dr. Ian Bond, the aerospace professor leading the research. We're also developing systems where the healing agent isn't contained in the individual glass fibers, but actually moves around as part of a fully integrated vascular network. That's incredible. Just yeah. like the circulatory systems found in animals and plants. Such a system could have its healing agent refilled or replaced and could repeatedly heal a structure throughout its lifetime. Furthermore, it offer, offers potential for developing other biological type functions in man-made structures such as controlling temperatures or distributing energy sources. Now this is about slight damage that occurs during right. flight. Dr. Bond said, this approach can deal with small-scale damage that's not obvious to the naked eye, but which might lead to very serious failures in structural integrity if it escapes attention. Uh, Bond says, it's intended to complement rather than replace conventional inspection and maintenance routines which can readily pick up larger scale damage caused by a bird strike, for example. Right. Uh, of course, sadly, much of the uh, credit, again, goes to nature. Yes, as and always. And evolution. Typical statements like, over millions of years, nature caused this creature to develop this amazing capability, etc. I mean, we, we see this stuff all the time, and of course, the credit for this amazing te technology is being totally misplaced. Yeah. Now, now, there's good evidence that animals become better adapted to changing environments. Creationists wrote about this long before Darwin. Animals, animals do engineer themselves to become better. Right. And there's, there, there's no doubt that that happens. Yeah, natural selection and, and programmed var variation. But there's limits. Exactly. That's the thing. There's limits to how far animals can change. That's right. DNA uh, has shown living things have been programmed by God to be able to adapt to changing environments. Uh, science verifies that. But, uh, but that programming, like you said, has limitations. And no matter how many yeah. times a lizard jumps off a cliff, it's not going to develop genetic information for feathers because genetic information from feathers does not exist in lizards and, uh, and mutations aren't doing that. Right. DNA becomes more garbled over time and evolutionists seem to completely ignore that. But it's, uh, it's just amazing. It, it, there's design in nature and we clearly see that. Right. Now, to, uh, we've, we've got some goodies here for you. Um, we've got a free DVD as well, but uh, I'll mention this book first. Buy Refuting Evolution 2, fantastic book, and get this DVD, Biblical Biology 101, for free. Refuting Evolution 2 deals with the attacks on creation from the media, and they're refuted in this book, and you can get a copy of The Basics of Biblical Biology for free. Just use the code CMLBBFREE. Just use that code and, uh, and get the free DVD when you get your copy of Refuting Evolution 2. Creation.com is the world's most powerful internet resource for finding answers to questions about the origins debate. It includes an online store where you can browse through hundreds of the world's leading creationist books, DVDs and related materials. Scientists and researchers from around the world have contributed more than 8,000 articles, many of which have appeared in leading creationist publications over more than 30 years. Creation or evolution? When the results are in, which one is supported by scientific observations? Find out at creation.com. Well, welcome to the feedback section. We've got a, um, a person who wrote in and asked us to help uh, defend his Christian beliefs uh, versus a, a skeptic. And you can look at this up on our website, creation.com slash breeding dash unicorns. And you'll, uh, you'll know what we're talking about here in a second. Sounds like fun. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, T.S. Uh, wrote in uh, asking us to help him spot the flaw in his friend's reasoning about hybrids, creatures that can hybridize. Okay. Hi, a friend of mine told me an interesting discussion he had today with some people at university. He apparently won an argument uh, saying because donkeys and horses have a different number of chromosomes, yet you can crossbreed them to create mules, 
uh, then you must be able to crossbreed any animal family. He gave the example of a narwhal and a horse creating a unicorn. I argued that because they are from a different family, they can't possibly create offspring, but, he, but could not find sufficient evidence to convince him. Any help with this would, would be appreciated. And uh, CMI's uh, Keaton Halley uh, responded. Yeah, now here's, a, here's a question. This is, this is part of what we try to do as a ministry. People write in questions. Here's yep. a guy with an honest question. Right? Yep. How come we can't make unicorns? And, and so, uh, so, so Keaton respi- uh, replies this way. Unfortunately, your friend's argument is logically invalid. To understand validity, please read Logic and Creation, especially the sections on validity and soundness. Or you can purchase Dr. Sarfati's lecture, Leaving Your Brains at the Church Door. Uh, <laughs> great, great DVD. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here's an argument with the same form, and the conclusion obviously doesn't follow from the premises. So have a look at this. Uh, number one, donkeys and horses have different numbers of chromosomes, but can produce offspring. Number two, horses and narwhals have different numbers of chromosomes. Number three, therefore, horses and narwhals can produce offspring. That's the argument, right? right? Here, here's, here's why it doesn't work logically. Yeah. Number one, sparrows and turkeys have different sizes and can lay eggs. Number two, hamsters and kangaroos have different <laughs> sizes. Number three, Therefore, hamsters and kangaroos can lay eggs. Right. It, obviously, the logic breaks down yeah. in, that, uh, in that argument. Exactly. So. See, one similarity doesn't mean they share everything in common. Right. right? If, if donkeys and horses can breed, that only shows that the, having the same number of chromosomes is not a necessary condition for breeding. But it doesn't prove that having a, a different number of chromosomes is sufficient. Um, it shows that some animals with mismatched chromosomes can hybridize, but not, n- that not all can. Right. Uh, successful yeah. reproduction depends on a whole lot of complicated biological factors, so we, you just can't tell whether two groups of animals can hybridize just by counting uh, their chromosomes. There's actually a, a, a butterfly that has over 84 different chromosome arrangements, but it's still the same kind of butterfly. And uh, we've, we've uh, talked about that before, the yeah. number of chromosomes. Uh, even people don't always have the same amount of chromosomes. Yeah, it's been. a little more complicated than just if you have the same number of chromosomes you can reproduce. It's a right. little more than that. And, and, and so. also, you know, if, if crossing a horse and a narwhal could really produce a unicorn, uh, then why hasn't anyone done it? <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, in, the, uh, in the response, um, you know, he, Keaton said, I'd pay to see a real unicorn. <laughs> so, yeah, I and probably I, would too. And but sure. My daughters would want to see it anyway. So, yeah, that's unicorn, right. Dad. That's, yeah. <laughs> That'd be cool. So, uh, yeah, really, uh, this, this example doesn't really uh, prove the fellow's point. <laughs> yeah. Creation Magazine Live. Obviously, we are based on uh, Creation Magazine. That's what we're doing yes. on the show. When Cal and I write these shows, a lot of the information we're getting that you're hearing on this, on this program comes from Creation Magazine articles That's right. uh, over the past uh, 35 years and more. And so you can get a free copy of Creation Magazine, a free digital copy. Go to creation.com slash free mag and get your, get your free copy. You can get a free sample copy there. Read the whole thing. There's links in there and uh, enjoy that free magazine, and we'll see you next week.